<clears throat> I'll begin <clears throat> with day one. The first sign that things were going terribly amiss was the quiet that fell over the entire land. You might remember, in my first entry, the sound I mentioned that the flies made. The billions, if not trillions upon trillions of them, making a humming so loud it hurt. That is true, but that came after the absolute silence. You see, what had happened was a plague swarm, a, a spreading cloud, a miasma, a cloying fog that drifted over the entire planet. I thought it was isolated to this area, but then the reports started pouring in that everywhere was suffering the same cloud, the same green-gray haze that wafted everywhere. At first, it didn't seem like much. A few people began to cough, but aside from that, we figured it would pass. But it didn't. It grew. And the coughing grew with it. The coughing became hacking. Blood began to spill from people's throats. Blood began to ooze from their arms. Fingernails began to crack. Toes split. Lips spread. Dried out. Mucus ran from nostrils. Tears and blood streamed from eyes and ears. When people realized what was happening and that it was this fog, this sickness, this illness, this horrible cloud, this contagion, masks were employed. Thousands upon thousands of masks were worn to fight off this horrible disease. For some it was enough, but for others it was much too late. I, working in a lab, had access to the finest of equipment and quickly put on a mask as soon as I saw any sort of fog. I only had a mild cough at first. But then... Then... Then the flies came. If not for the humming, I might have been able to keep my wits about me. But the droning that the flies caused was so horrific, so loud, so monumental a cacophony, that truly words fail to contain the amount of sound that came from that. If, if I had been able to keep my wits about me, I might have been able to lock myself in a chamber. Maybe, maybe there was some room, some lab. Surely, surely the basement would have kept me safe, at least for a time. But as it was, I couldn't think straight, and the flies surrounding me, surrounding everything, began to churn through the very fabric of the suit that I wore. I don't know if they were biting or if it was simply so many beating their wings around me that my hazmat suit torn to shreds by the swarm of flies. Once my suit was destroyed, a cloud of toxin wafted in over my skin and into my nose, into my nostril, into my eyes, just as it had everyone else on the planet. The strangest thing about this toxin was that it seemed to affect different people in different ways. Some were affected strongly, and others were affected not so much. There were only a few of the latter, I being one of them. Most <clears throat> of the planet's inhabitants were killed within moments after breathing in the horrible cloud of toxins. But a few... Myself and some others that I see wandering around in a state of confused distress were... I pause, <clears throat> because I was about to say the lucky ones, and that is, um... I'm not so sure of how lucky we are. I consider myself lucky because I get to study the effects this has on my body. As I said in that first address, I am curious of how this will go. Speaking of that curiosity, I've tried speaking to some of the others, some that have come to this planet, and to say that has gone poorly would be a understatement of the year. I've had no luck in communicating with them whatsoever. The only sounds that the poxwalkers make, as I have learned they are called, are guttural groans and moans of the sort that I truly cannot comprehend. 
if there is any communication being had there, I don't know what it is. They do seem to communicate with each other in some form or fashion, and I wonder, even time, <clears throat> I will learn this language of theirs, if it is a language, or if, as I suspect, they are simply going through the motions and there's no true understanding passing between them. I don't know. Another thing to remain curious about, I suppose. <laughs> oh. My chest hurts. My arms bake. Earlier, I put a finger, uh, my right finger, against the skin of my left arm. And for whatever reason, I began to press. I noticed the flesh of my arm was quite soft there, about six, eight inches up from my wrist, quite near my elbow, where the arm widens. A fleshy part there, right before the, the crook of your elbow. I, I noticed it seemed softer than normal, so I, I, I set my finger there, and as I said, I began to press. And immediately, my finger sank into my arm. And that struck me as quite odd, because never before had my finger done that. I don't know that I'd ever tried to push my finger into my arm in this fashion before, but I certainly would have remembered if I'd pushed my finger into my arm. The next strange thing had happened, or maybe I should say didn't happen, was a complete lack of blood. It was as though my arm were made of paper, or some sort of crumbling, decaying, dried mass, much like a, 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 a tree stump when it rots. There was a hollowness to my arm. Bend, to answer your question, yes, I did keep on pushing. Now, I know you didn't ask that, but if I were in your shoes, that's certainly what I would be wondering. I continued to press, wondering if I would be able to touch the bone in my arm. Would I, would I reach the bone? Could I reach the bone? Sure enough, after a few more inches, I met the bone, or all it was now was a slightly more resistant part of my arm, but I was able to push my finger through that as well. I pushed my finger straight through the other side of my arm. That was when I realized maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe. Maybe my body will fall apart far quicker if I continue such, dare I say, experiments in this manner. Maybe I should be more careful with myself. So I withdrew my finger and you may find this strange, you may find this foul, you may find this curious, I do not know, but at the time it made the absolute most sense to me. You see, what I did at that point was gather up a pile of the flies. Now, I mentioned earlier there were billions, if not tens of trillions of these flies coating the entire planet. That trillions might actually be a small fraction of the number of these flies. And they didn't last all that long. And they have now fallen to the ground and there is a inch, in some places even three inches deep, surface of these flies covering everything. And over the course of the past couple of days, they have started to putrefy and rot and turn into a mush that everyone walks through at this point. So I gathered up a handful of this muck, this slush, balled it up in my hands, made a bit of a no, how would I describe it? A, a, a finger-sized cylinder. I assure you, at the time, this made the absolute most sense to me. It's only now that I realize how bizarre this is. I took that wad that I had created and inserted it into the hole in my arm. And the most wonderful but also strange thing happened. That rot, that, that lump of those flies, the filth that I had pulled up off the ground and formed into that strange little roll and inserted in my arm, 
melded with the flesh of my arm. Now, when I look at my arm as I am now, I'm looking at the very spot where I put that, I only see a black smear, a darkened circle there, right, right below my, my elbow. If I turn my arm and look at the other side where I'd punched my finger all the way through, I see the same dark spot. But for all intents and purposes, my arm still works about the same as it did two days ago. Or three days ago. Or earlier this afternoon. Time has gotten wonky and I... My eyes don't work the same way that they used to when I look at a clock. <clears throat> the numbers don't make quite as much sense as they once did. I can only imagine this is part of the process of whatever I'm becoming, or maybe it's a process of unbecoming. The Wages of Heresy When Mortarion joined Horus's rebellion and swore himself to the service of the Dark Gods, he had no idea of the terrible price that he and his sons would pay. The once proud legion was overcome by a uniquely grotesque and terrifically fitting damnation, driven into Nurgle's superating embrace by a pestilence that even they could not withstand. Mortarion took command of his new army with proprietorial severity. Though he was cold and aloof towards his sons, they worshipped him unquestioningly and followed his teachings to the letter. Mortarion saw in them an opportunity to continue his labors upon Barbarus. He would forge the Death Guard into perfect infantrymen, adaptable and self-reliant warriors who specialized in the use of durable weaponry that was easily maintained and resupplied. The Death Guard were taught to choose the best ground, and then to grind their enemies down upon it with massed infantry formations. They were the anvil to their allies' hammers, or else the bludgeon that battered the foe into submission. Some amongst Mortarion's brothers disparaged his tactics as blunt and unimaginative. In truth, the doctrines of the Death Guard were durable and efficient, and demonstrated a remarkable talent for grassroots martial organization that earned the Death Guard a truly impressive honor roll of victories during the Great Crusade. Mortarion's gene seed made his sons hardy. Through his swiftly imposed regimens of toxin hardening and extreme environment tempering, the former Dusk Raiders became more durable than ever. This inherent toughness only increased, for Mortarion recruited the bulk of his new legionaries from Barbarus. The Death Guard were rightly proud of their indomitable physiology. They deployed into the most hazardous war zones where even other space marines hesitated to tread and made widespread use of RAD and Phosphex weaponry, alongside prescribed viral agents that soon earned them something of a dark reputation amongst their brothers. Mortarion cared not for the distaste of his peers. His personal mission was the overthrowing of tyrants, being such as the Carrion Lords of Barbarus, and he took pride that his sons could employ their own rugged strength to defend those too weak to protect themselves. Still, for all their achievements, the labors of the Death Guard went largely unrecognized. Mortarion was far closer to his brother Horus, than to his sire, the Emperor, believing that the former recognized his worth far better than the latter ever would. Worse, the longer they fought to shield the weak from oppression, the more the Death Guard became overly enamored of their own fortitude and dismissive of those too weak to protect themselves. And when the Horus Heresy tore the Imperium in two, Mortarion was amongst the first to throw in his lot with a war master. In Horus's name, the Death Guard cut a swath through their former brothers from Istvan III to Terra itself. Yet along the way, a hideous curse overcame them. It was during Horus's final advance toward Terra that the Death Guard fleet was becalmed in an impenetrable warp storm, its ships reduced to drifting through the Immaterium. 
while they were stilled, the destroyer came. For Mortarion and his death guard, there was nothing so terrifying as a plague that made their legendary resilience meaningless. Pestilence, contagion, toxin, and pollution, there was no environment so hostile that the death guard could not overcome it. Until the destroyer plague rolled through their fleet. It roiled in their guts, bloating and distending their once superhuman bodies, transforming them into horrible, pustulant grotesques. They were made corrupt within and sickening to behold without. They grew ever more ill, yet they could not die, their own constitution becoming their worst enemy. What they endured was unimaginable, and none suffered worse than Mortarion. Whether he perceived in those terrible hours the loss of what he had once stood for, and the damnation he had wrought upon himself and his legion, only Mortarion will ever know. Unable to endure any longer, Mortarion offered his soul and those of all his sons to the Immaterium in exchange for deliverance. A presence answered, as though it had been waiting all along. In the depths of the warp, the great god Nurgle, Lord of Decay and Father of Disease, claimed the Death Guard for his own. What emerged from the warp when the Death Guard fleet reached Terra bore little resemblance to that which had entered. The gleaming white and gray armor of the former Imperial champions was no more, burst and shattered from the horrible bloating of infected bodies and scabbed with boils, putrescence, and the filth of corruption. Their weapons and war machines were now powered by the sickly sorcery of chaos, glowing with baleful green luminescence and oozing pus. The last betrayed echoes of the Dark Raiders were gone forever. In their place stood the Death Guard, feet planted unrepentantly amidst the superating filth that lay at the end of their path to damnation. They had become plague marines, putrid travesties of their former selves that seethed with the hideous blessings of Grandfather Nurgle. Some of Mortarion's sons embraced their new form, believing in their arrogance that they had passed through the eye of the needle and proved themselves the only mortals worthy of Nurgle's patronage. Others hated the plague that had laid them low, the weakness it implied. For these warriors, nothing would suffice but to spread ruin and sickness until the entire galaxy was brought down to their level. Others still were driven quite mad, taking on aspects of rambunctious glee or morose, entropic misery. Whatever the case, the Death Guard had become Nurgle's servants, body and soul, forevermore. In the millennia of war that followed, their devotion to their rancid deity would only deepen further. These curse think to hide amidst the clouds of irradiated gases they have unleashed. They believe that because they are too weak of body and mind to endure such conditions, that we too must share their frailty and shall be turned aside by the desolation they have wrought. They think that the surface of this poisoned planet will kill us, just as it would them. Brothers, let us disabuse them of this notion. Captain Ignatius Grugor, the Dolithor Address Of Sorcery and Treachery During his years on Barbarus, Mortarion learned to hate psychers. The Carrion Lord used such powers to animate their macabre puppet armies, and ever after the Primarch harbored mistrust for any who exhibited such abilities. His was the loudest and most insistent voice condemning the Librarius division within the Legionis Astartes, and it was Mortarion's remorseless vitriol that turned the ill-fated Council of Nikea from a trial into a witch hunt. Though Mortarion forbade librarians within his legion's ranks, he could not do without psychers entirely. To him, navigators, astropaths, and their ilk were a necessary evil, one he sought to rationalize through his obsession with arcane pseudoscience. Nor could Mortarion prevent the recruitment of latent psychers into the ranks of the Death Guard. Instead, 
instilling that all such legionaries stifle their abilities upon pain of disgrace and exile. One such individual was Callus Typhon, the captain of Mortarion's first company and one of his most trusted warriors. Typhon wholeheartedly embraced the Davenate warrior lodges that spread through the Death Guard and the worship of the dark gods they brought with them. Moreover, when the Destroyer Plague finished its hideous work, it was into his body that it poured, empowering him as a favored champion of Nurgle. Typhus, host of the Destroyer Hive, was this mere coincidence, or was it a reward for a betrayal well executed and a final liberation from Mortarion's crushing edicts? In the wake of the Legion's hideous transformation, it no longer seemed to matter, for none remained sane enough to care.